In the town of Alma, Kansas, sits a chair. But if you sit there, you'll disappear. You, now, from now on, these intros are all going to rhyme. And then we traveled to Russia to take a look at a group of coal miners who found a giant box deep inside of a coal mine. When they're able to get it to the surface and they try to open it up, they have no idea they're about to unlock an 800 million year old mystery. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys are having tons of fun doing whatever you're doing. We got a lot of stuff to cover, so we're going to get started right away. First off, walking into Dead Rabbit Command right now, everyone get on your feet and give a big round of applause for our newest Patreon supporter, Melissa. Woohoo, yeah! Come on in, Melissa. She's bringing in a birthday cake. Oh, man. <laughs> man, I'm still trying to eat through that ice cream cake I got on Saturday. Uh, Melissa, just go ahead. <laughs> she made the cake herself. I'm like, I just throw it in the corner there. Uh, maybe I'll get to it eventually. But Melissa, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the Patreon, or if you haven't gotten diabetes over the past 24 hours, that's fine too. Preferably you didn't have the second one. Just help spread the word about the show. That really, really, really helps out a lot. Now, Melissa, I'm going to go ahead and toss you the hair hang glider. Everyone grab onto her ankles. And Melissa, jump off the highest point of Dead Rabbit Command. We're going to glide all the way out to Alma, Kansas. <sighs> I'm eating ice cream cake as we're flying. I'm, uh. Melissa, land us gracefully as you can here at Alma, Kansas. We're walking around the town of Alma. It's a tiny little town. It has less than a thousand people in it. We're walking around. Within probably like an hour, we could say hi to everyone if there's only a thousand people. Actually, Jamie, can you run the math on that? How many people? Let's actually find out. If I greeted a person a minute, it would take me a thousand minutes so never mind, never mind, forgive my original, my original assumption, this is not a math class podcast. Takes us a while, but we finally say hello to everyone in the city of Alma, and that's not why we're here. We're actually here to check out Alma's cemetery. So finally, when we walk out of town, a thousand minutes later as we walk out of town, we're going to reach Alma's cemetery. Alma Cemetery is what it's known as. And as we're walking through it, I go, hey, bro, dude, check this out. You see that over there? And I'm like, have my arm wrapped around you. And I'm like, get you to show cold and I'm making you look where I'm pointing. Look, look over there. That is known as the devil's chair. And you see like this chair just sitting in the cemetery. And I go, according to legend, if you sit in that chair, everything's fine, right? It's just a comfy chair. You sit in a chair, no big deal. But... If you sit in that chair and nobody's looking at you, you disappear. So it's kind of like that movie, Don't Blink. Did you guys ever see that movie with Brian Austin Green and Mena Savari? Pretty decent movie. Basically, it's the same setup, except that took place in a cabin. If someone's not looking at you, you disappear. You totally disappear. So I'm dragging you <laughs> over to this chair and I sit you down and then I go okay buddy thanks for listening to the show really really appreciate it but uh <laughs> but a bird just flew by I gotta look in the other direction and I turn around and when I look back you're gone back in the 1800s there's a little bit of history that goes along with this story apparently right this uh, there have been other paranormal researchers that have looked into this back in the 1800s though this is the story where the city of Alma is now, it was founded back in 1867, so late 1800s. There was this farmer, there was this mean old farmer who owned all of this land in the portion of what would eventually become the cemetery. And he had all of this land, he had all of this land and just to himself, and he's sitting there and he's like, oh, he's not even letting the cows graze on his land. They're like, dude, you're a farmer, you should share it with your cows. Never! This is my, this is my grass to chew. He was a mean old farmer, and the city eventually was like, you know, we really need to build a cemetery somewhere in town. Maybe we, maybe we should ask the meanest man around if he'll give us some land. 
So the townspeople, not all of them, it wasn't like a lynch mob or anything, but, you know, you have city officials go out to him and his name, I don't, they don't have his name, or at least I didn't write it down in my notes, but he was Farmer Jim. Town officials come out and they go, hey, Jim, we were wondering if we could buy some of this land to build our cemetery on. He's like, well, haven't you guys heard my reputation? I'm like the meanest dude around. And they're like, yeah, we kind of knew that. But we were figuring, you know, we do this whole thing where we give you money and you give us some in return. He's all chasing mob with a bitch for it. He's like, I'm too mean to understand capitalism. Get out of here. Well, the city really wanted this land. I wonder if it's like, I don't know why they specifically wanted his land. Maybe it was flat. I imagine graveyards, you prefer them to be flat. You don't want, like, a super bumpy graveyard. You don't want, like, rolling hills. <laughs> you don't want it to look like this peaceful glen, a river running through it. And it would just be easier to mow. <laughs> I imagine that's why you want a flat cemetery. I, you want to want to put a cemetery in, like, a hilly area or a lot of gravel and stuff like that. Anyway, so they really wanted this land. He wouldn't sell it to them. Well, one day, the townspeople, they continue to go out there, apparently. They're like, maybe it'll be different. Maybe he won't chase us away with a pitchfork. Maybe it'll just be a shotgun full of rock salt, and that's an improvement. They go out there one day, and they're like, Jim, hey, Jim, we're here to get chased off your farm again. Jim? Hey, Jim. I couldn't find him anywhere. Jim, where you at, buddy? Eventually, the city officials, they check everywhere, and they're like, where possibly could Jim be? I don't know, but I started smelling something weird. This might have something to do with the mysterious disappearance of this guy. I smell something really weird coming from the well. It smells kind of like stinky down there. And sure enough, the, the well is stinky. The well smell, well, stinky's probably understating it. It smells like rotting flesh. The smell, it smells like death. And they kind of look down the well, but they don't investigate it too much. They just go, oh, well, I guess then that we couldn't find Jim. And for all we know, he abandoned this property. Let's go ahead and just uh, take it over. Let's build a cemetery here. That's what Jim would have wanted anyways. And maybe if he ever comes back in town, we'll give him the money for his land. And so they ended up building the Alma Cemetery on his land. Well, flash forward to the 1980s. So it's a pretty long jump, right, between the initial mystery of what happened at Farmer Jim's property to now, or to the 1980s. An urban legend starts to spring up around town. Hey, you know that cemetery, Alma Cemetery, the only cemetery in town? Yeah, sure, buddy. Well, let's go there. Let's go there and hang out. And I heard that there's a chair you can sit in for all you, for all you teens that are into drugs and alcohol, but also want to rest your legs. Apparently, right near the spot where Jim had, quote-unquote, gone missing, right? The idea is that he fell into the well and couldn't get out and died. There was a chair, right? Because everything was just kind of covered up. There was a chair there. Maybe it was part of somebody's gravestone. Maybe it was just a folding chair that some lazy guy brought, sat down for a funeral, and he's too lazy to carry it out. He's like, ah, whatever. There's this chair there, and teenagers started going there late at night. They're drinking having sex, they're doing all the stuff you see in those movies, and one of the teenagers goes missing. What? Where'd Joey go? Oh, oh. They gnashed their teeth and lamented Joey. So the legend arose. I don't know how many times this happened, right? Generally, like we say on the show, the first one is an anomaly, the second one's a coincidence, but the third time's a phenomenon. You would have to have it happen so many times before this legend started. If you sit in the devil's chair and no one's looking at you, you will disappear. That's a legend that sprung up around town. I'm sure teenagers are putting to a test and all of that stuff. And to this day, it is a ghost story. It's a ghost story that has left the town of Alma and hit the age of the internet. Now, what's really interesting is I originally found out, if I remember correctly, I originally found out about this from my favorite book, The National Directory of Haunted Places. And I was researching this. And two ghost hunting groups did on-the-ground research into this area. One of them we talked about last week. They're a now-defunct paranormal group called Anam Paranormal. They had boots on the ground. They were doing an investigation in this area. The other one is a group called DarkKansas.com. 
Now, when I I I, I had I've had these notes sitting there for like a year. I had this story ready to go for a long time. And I'm trying to do like a ghost story a day for Halloween, like this 31 days of October, or spooktobular, whatever, whatever, whatever I came up with. I'm just hoping to get a ghost story per episode for the first week. And then after that, who knows what's going to happen. But I've been going through my notes. I've been looking for some really cool ghost stories. What's so interesting about this, and, and this could just be a coincidence, but Last week, I told you guys that Anam Paranormal is gone. Their website's completely gone. Everything they did is scrubbed from the internet. They investigated this. Dark Kansas, the other group that investigated this, is also no more. Website's completely gone. All their research is gone. Now, the most likely scenario is that the groups broke up and they could no longer or no longer had a will to pay their hosting bills for the internet hosting website. And all the information was gone. However, I do find that, like I said, once is a once is an anomaly, twice is a coincidence. It is interesting that both these groups both investigated the devil's chair and then they both went out of business. So on the other hand, these paranormal groups go out of business quite often. Same thing with paranormal podcasts, right? I always hope that the show goes on for a long time, but you just don't know, right? External factors can always interfere with things. So both of these websites are down that talked about it. Really, all I have in my notes that you can click on is the Wikipedia page for Alma, Kansas. It, all of this on the boot stuff is gone. But what's in? I, what, I mean, obviously, I have the story prepped to go. I have these notes to look at. What's interesting is one of the two groups, and I'm not for sure which one I got this from, but they talk about, listen, if you go to Alma Cemetery now, there is no chair. It doesn't exist anymore. They said... What you'll find is this kind of rickety old structure type of thing. Not like it has a roof or anything like that, but it's just... You see the remains of something, and it's right over a deep well. So the 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 initial part of the story does seem to be true. They have this well. <laughs> they have a well. <laughs> Who wants to drink fresh water out of a graveyard? But... I'm sure some wizard is glad that that's still there. Cast can use it to cast some spells, but there's this deep well and there's like a rotting structure over it. And the theory was was people that the story does have a little bit of legs to it, where people were goofing off in this area and they were falling into the well, and and that's where the idea of oh and they disappeared and I never saw them again. They just fell. They fell 20 feet into a well and then someone had to go get a rope. Or get the fire department to get the dude out. So that probably did happen a couple times in the 80s as you had these people walking around the graveyard drinking and smoking and all that stuff. You probably did have a couple of reports of people falling into the well. And that became the story of if you if you sit there and no one's looking at you, you disappear forever. What's interesting though is we also have I also have these notes in my show notes, and again, it sucks because we don't know exactly which group did this investigation. But they had another take on it. They go, yeah, there is something you can sit on. You may not necessarily call it a chair, but there is an area you can sit down. And remember, the legend is if no one's looking at you, that's when this happens. They said, I went to this location and I sat down. I was about to sit down. We're there with a couple friends and I said, hey, I'm going to go ahead and sit in this chair. But don't look away because that's a key component of this mystery. I'm going to sit in this chair right next to this well, right next to this well opening. Don't look away. And this ghost researcher says, as I was sitting down, both of my friends swear they heard something behind them. And as my butt's about to hit the chair, they're actually turning around to look at something in the distance. So the person leapt up out of the chair and started screaming at him for turning around. Dude, I told you guys not to turn around. And they said, it's almost like an involuntary thing. Like, as someone's sitting down, another noise happens that makes you turn to look. It's an interesting phenomenon. This is a place that I would really like to see some photos from. I would really, I would really like to see a photo of you from the well. Just the camera's like looking up at a circle of light. In the sky. I think it's fascinating. I love these type of stories, right? Where you get a little bit of truth, 
a little bit of legend. You get a ghost story with a rational explanation, right? Like, I'm sure people have fallen into this well. Because who expects for there to be a well in a graveyard? And mo- teenagers aren't visiting the graveyards during the sunniest part of the day, right? They're doing it at night where they won't get caught by the police, where they can smoke and drink and fool around and all that stuff. And when you add all that stuff in, the chances of you falling into a well go up, right? When you're drinking Jägermeister right out of the bottle that you stole from your dad's cabinet, there's a pretty high likelihood that you're going to fall into a well if one is nearby. It's a fascinating story. I really do want to do like a ghost story a day this month. I've never been able to pull off a full spooktobular. I always just kind of forget. I always just kind of forget halfway through the month what month it is. But that's two in a row, baby. We got those, and I really like the story. And it is again. I hate it to. I hate to see these paranormal groups go under. It is unfortunately a a risk of the business. I'm not saying that both of these groups eventually they all fell into the well. Although I could say that because they both investigated it. But yeah, it sucks. These groups do this, and they get a lot of good information, and then one day you just go to check the website, and gone. But thanks for your on-the-ground research and all the work you've done before, Anam Paranormal and Dark Kansas. Melissa, let's go ahead and toss you the keys to the world-famous carbon copter. We're leaving behind Alma, Kansas. Fly us all the way out to Russia. <laughs> this is another story like the first one that's interesting because you can kind of see how parts of it could be real. Parts of it could be legend, and I believe in this one, parts of it could be government disinformation. Definitely government disinformation. Purposely making the story more ridiculous than it may have originally started off. But we're headed back to Russia. Specifically, we're in the town of Zavchik. That's in the Tulsky district of the Kemerova region in Russia. It's September 1969, and it's a bright, sunny morning. Hey, dude, bring that coal over, some guy yells, and all of a sudden we're wearing, like, old coal mining Russian outfits. We're like, oh, man, we got the hat on with a little lamp, and some guy's hitting us with a shovel. Get in the coal! Get the day started! Go down there! And all of a sudden we're walking through this coal mine. We're just like, we become slaves in this I don't think. They were getting beat with shovels. I'm sure people are like happy to show up for work in the coal mine. But anyways, they're walking through the coal mine. And we're about to meet a guy at the bottom of this coal mine. And when I say bottom, we're going down 230 feet. We're walking through the coal mine and stuff like that. Oh, my legs are tired. I'm in a mine cart. You guys are pushing me. I'm all... I ate so much ice cream cake. I can't walk anymore. We're about to meet a guy named Alexander Ivanovich Karnikov. And he's standing down there at the bottom of the mine. He is a blacksmith working for the mine. So he's probably down there like repairing something. I don't know. Maybe repairing the mine cart that I shattered with my ice cream infused weight. He's down there. He's fixing stuff. And it's funny. I got to say right now in this detail, he's a blacksmith in the mine. There's a lot of variations of the story. A lot of time, if you're familiar with the story, you're probably thinking, no, no, that's not true. They, this this story's been told so many times that there have been other news sites that have tried to correct some of the details because a lot of these people did exist. A lot of these people did exist. They just are going to be involved in such a fantastical story that you really start to think, like, what is real and what isn't. But Alexander Ivanovich Karnikov was actually the blacksmith of the mining company. He was not a miner himself. You'll see other reports stating that. He's a blacksmith. He's working down there. And while they're down there, in the darkness, they have their little headlamps, probably some lamps hanging from the ceiling. They probably had modern technology, actually. It wasn't like a little oil lamp. But anyways, as they're down there, Alexander finds, embedded in the wall of the cave, it's actually sticking out of this coal seam along the side of the wall, the side of the mine. They see this giant rectangular box. And they can obviously tell it doesn't belong to part of the... It's not a natural formation. For one, it's made of marble. So even a geology expert would realize it doesn't normally... just a a giant thing of marble, like a giant perfectly... Well, marble does come from mines, but... I mean, not perfectly... (laughs) Not perfectly ornately carved a six-foot-long 
marble rectangle inside of this coal seam. So they immediately start like, being like, okay, whatever we were doing today, we're coal miners, we're getting coal. Let's coal mine this particular part. Let's get this giant chunk of marble out. Because they can obviously tell it's not a natural formation. All work at the site is stopped. Everything stops because they want to get this out of here. They can see that it is man-made. Not just from the smooth edges, not that it's just a perfect rectangle, but there's a seam. There's a seam that runs along the upper top of it. Like there's a lid on it and they see a seam and it's covered with this paste. It's covered with some sort of sealant on it. So anyways, all work is stopped. They're able to get this giant heavy box out of the coal seam. And slowly but surely, they move it out of the mine onto the surface. And it was sealed with this putty that they could tell it had been... It, whatever, However long this has been down here for, the sealant had petrified. It had turned to stone. So they're out there in the morning sun, and they're smashing this thing. This is a wondrous thing. They want to get it open. They're smashing it with hammers and chisels and stuff like that, and they can't break through the putty. And they just keep smash, smash. They can't do it. They're taking shifts. They're trying to get this open, and it won't open up. However, the putty starts to slowly drip, drip, drip off. And it's not because of all of the force they're applying to it. The sun... The heat of the mid-morning sun is melting off this sealant. Now, it's September. The sun's not that hot. It's not that hot out. However, this box was never meant to be exposed to the sun. So the sealant completely drips off onto the ground. And as it's dripping off, this this shows an intrepid individual. I, I consider myself a pretty good hunter of the weird. I wouldn't do this. <laughs> I, wouldn't do, I would never do this, right? This guy, as the sealant is dripping off, at this point it's pretty much just liquid running down the side of this box and just dropping across the forest floor. Some dude licks it. He runs his finger through it and goes, mm, uh, that's good putty. Oh, that's the most delicious putty. He licked it. And according to reports, he's a guy we don't have the name of. Because nobody would want to report this dude's name. But according, and This is a story that the locals in the area will swear up and down is true. And that's what I like about this. Because I'm going to tell you the story as we know it. And then I'm going to tell you what I think is the government disinformation. But one of the guys, the locals probably know it. would be like, oh, that we know him as Crazy Joey. Cra Crazy Joey, for sure. He licked this goo off. And they said that a week later... He went crazy, and the next February, February 1970, he froze to death right outside of his own home. So, just a word to the wall. <laughs> if you ever find the giant box hidden in the earth, don't lick it. I might lick an alien's head, like a gray alien. I might walk up to it and lick the back of its head. You know, that would probably be how much licking I would do. But uh, don't do that. Don't probably don't do the alien thing either. That's not an endorsement of that. I would just be curious. You have that, and and one thing to kind of skip to the end too. Almost all the principals in this story, we have Alexander who found it. Then we have another Alexander who is the guy who runs the mining company or in charge of the operation in this area, and a bunch of other principals in this story. They're all dead within a year too. And you'll see a lot of reports, like one of them died of an ulcer, one of them got crushed under the wheels of a giant Soviet-era truck. So this story leaves a bloodbath as well, and that's, again, people go, people in the area go, it was a cover, like that guy really didn't die of an ulcer, that person was not accidentally killed underneath the wheels of that six-axle truck who was killed by the government. But anyways, the, the guy who went crazy, the guy who went crazy from licking the stuff, the Soviets didn't have to do anything to him. They just figured his time was coming up. Anyways, this giant box is now on the surface. The putty has completely melted off. And they are finally able to lift the lid 
the men of the coal mining company now find themselves standing around an open coffin. This sarcophagus was filled almost to the brim with a pink, blue, pink and blue mixed together, crystal clear liquid. I love that detail. It doesn't make sense. Right? Try to imagine that. Try to imagine pink and blue mixed together in such perfect amounts that you can see both colors and one color doesn't overpower the other one. And it's see-through. The story could totally be made up, but in the world of the paranormal, in the world of UFOs, things like that, we'll see things that just don't make sense. Because they don't make sense. It's a world paranormal. So they're looking at this liquid and it's pink and blue in equal measures. One is not more than the other. And it's see-through at the same time. You can look right through it. And submerged in this liquid is a human. A human woman. She's described as five foot nine. She's Slavic. She has Slavic features. And her eyes are wide open. Big, beautiful blue eyes staring upwards. But she's dead. She's clearly deceased. Although, what makes you think she's deceased is she's not moving. She's been in, she's in a coffin. She's in a coffin. She's been down in this coal mine for who knows how long. Remember, this was embedded into the side of the mine. So it's not like someone just dropped her off yesterday. However, although they reasonably know that she's dead, just from all of that, she has her, her cheeks are blush. Like she it looks like she has color in her face. They describe her as being around 30 years old. That would be the age that you would think. And she had long blonde hair. Thick, dark blonde curls that reached all the way down to her waist. And she's laying there perfectly still, submerged in this liquid. Near her head is a small black rectangular box just sitting there. And it's been compared, they don't give any details as to specifically this, but it's been compared to the size. The size and the general shape would be the equivalent of a cell phone. They are not They are not saying it's a cell phone. They weren't saying that there was a screensaver or buttons on it or anything like that. That's just kind of what it's been compared to. She was also only wearing one thing. She was wearing a long, see-through, totally see-through dress. A lace dress. No underwear. So all these perverts, a thousand fetishes were born that day at the coal mine. All these perverts could look around at this naked woman wearing this see-through lace dress. And if you didn't know she was pulled out of a sarcophagus that was embedded deep inside of a coal mine, you would have thought she was just sleeping. I mean, also, not underneath this ethereal goo. If this body was just sitting in your bed, you would assume that this woman was just sleeping. Now, this was a coal mine very near the town of Rashchik. Right? It was right there. So, as, like, once the box is found, you already had people going to the village being like, dude, we found something really weird at the coal mine. We found a giant box. And you'd have, like, grandmas there making pancakes and say, ah, giant box, I don't care about that. Back in 1863, we found the biggest box of all. Uh, you kids in your boxes. You... Have people going back, leaving the coal mine and telling people about this. Oh, we we're, we finally got it free from the side of the mountain. We're hauling it up. Oh, you know, I'll come down there and check it out. Yeah, come on down. So by the time that this box is getting opened up, people are still running back and forth to the village, being like, we got it sealed. And some crazy guy ate some of it. Can you believe that? More and more people are coming to see this as this is progressing, because this is all happening in the morning. And by the end, when the box is finally opened up and you realize it's a coffin and people are running back to town for the remaining, like, two dozen people that haven't come out to see it yet, they're like, dude, there's a woman in the box. And even then, <laughs> the grandma's done making pancakes at that point. She's like, what? Everyone in the village came to look at this thing because they have this giant stone sarcophagus with a woman inside of it. And 
inside this liquid. There's a bunch of perverts again. They're like, oh, she's nude. I can't wait to be down there. So, of course, the authorities are also alerted. You have, like, firefighters showing up. I think they have a better thing to do. You know the military and the police are going to say, well, the firefighters, cats left in trees all over the region. So a bunch of firefighters can come out there and see this. This astonishing sight. And, of course, the police and the military did show up, and they're taking a look at it, and they have no idea what to do. This is obviously some sort of anomaly. We've covered a lot of Soviet UFO stories, and the one thing that always happens in these stories is the Soviet government gets involved. So by 2 p.m. that same day, a massive, what's known as, they keep using this terminology, brick-colored helicopter. A brick-colored helicopter, which I'm assuming is what we would call like a tan helicopter, like a clay brick. I don't think it was like a red brick, but like a clay, like a military-type helicopter, right? Military cargo helicopter. <laughs> Comes to the area. And you got to love the Soviet Union. I mean, they did kill tens of millions of people in one of the most brutal regimes in modern times, but... They, for some reason, think everyone's an idiot. This giant military vehicle lands and outsteps 12 people in civilian clothes. Because, you know, they just want to blend in with the locals, right? Even though they just got off of this huge military helicopter and start barking orders at everybody, telling everyone to get out of here. And that was almost the scariest thing you could see. Running into a KGB officer was bad. But if you ever entered a room and there was two KGB officers in KGB uniforms, and also in that room was a just a normal-looking dude in sweater and slacks, you were done. You were absolutely done. If you ever ran into a KGB agent and he was dressed like a civilian, that guy's so high-ranking, it'd, it'd be the worst possible nightmare. You'd rather be in a room with three dudes in full like police officer uniforms then just a dude walk into a room and sit down next to you and go like, hi, my name is Tony. I'm, I'm a normal person just like you. You're going to get your hands chopped off at that point. So these civilian, quote unquote, civilians get off this military copter and started giving orders to everyone. And obviously the police, the military, everybody knew who these dudes were, right? So they just did what they said. And everyone was ordered to go home. They told the police and the military that was there, this entire area is cordoned off. Nobody gets back in here. And as they're sending people home, they're also stopping people. And they're saying, you, 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 you go with these doctors who are also apparently getting off of this helicopter for an immediate medical examination. And they were targeting people who were standing closest to the sarcophagus. So the entire area gets cleared out. And it's just these people, these 12 dudes now, who are left standing around the sarcophagus. So at this point in the story, the only witnesses that would be to this would be the police or the military who was standing there doing the barricade right doing the cordon but apparently what happened was these civilians these 12 dudes wanted to take the sarcophagus but they thought it's too heavy to move with all of this liquid in it what if we pump the liquid out we'll save the liquid we'll pump it out and we'll put it in these containers but then it'll probably be easier to move this thing get it on the helicopter so they begin pumping out this fluid and as the level of the fluid is getting lower and lower and lower and lower, eventually it's almost all gone, and the body begins to blacken. The young woman, her blush goes away, her skin darkens. It looks like she is decaying incredibly fast. So they start pumping the liquid back into the sarcophagus. It fills up, and she once again regains her luster. She looks like she's not dead, but sleeping. They go, fine, I'll take some extra work. You know, probably should have kept some of those coal miners around, the ones who got it up here in the first place. But they are able to finally move it onto the helicopter, the brick-colored helicopter. The 12 men get on it as well, along with any other personnel they brought with them. And the helicopter leaves the area. Shortly afterwards, the coal mine is given orders to 
close off the area that the sarcophagus was found in. They're no longer allowed to go down there for any sort of reason. Not coal mining, not looking for other coffins, nothing. You got to seal it up. And by 1973, the mine was completely shut down. You can go to this area now, it's just dense forest. The place has been recovered by nature. 1973 is also important because just four miles away from the mine is a place known as Lake Burchikel. Lake Burchikel. 1973, around the same time that the mine is shut down, the area is flooded with military and police. And they completely cordon off the shore of the lake and a large-scale excavation operation begins. This would be reports you'd be getting from the locals. You started to have sightings of, obviously, major work being done in this area, machinery and things like that. But also, you'd keep seeing the brick-colored helicopter flying in and out of the area. Eventually... The military blockade ends of the shoreline. They leave, right? The military leaves, the police leave, the cordon is done. And so, of course, the villagers are curious as to what was going on. They would only see the occasional thing or maybe hear the occasional whisper from a drunken visitor to their tent, from a drunken soldier or police officer coming into the town for a drink. Once the cordon ends... The villagers go out to the shoreline and they see what looks like hundreds of freshly dug graves. But then the graves were covered back up. Let me just see these dotting the shoreline. That is the story of this phenomenon. What I find fascinating about it is I'm, I left out, I mentioned in the show intro, but I kind of skipped over it here. I'm, I am going to address it. Five days after the initial find, five days after this body was found, an elder this this happened in the town. This elderly man showed up to the village and said, I'm a professor, I'm a professor from a local college, and I'm here to tell you about what was found. And he tells a tale that's so unbelievable that I believe is government disinformation. There's a chance the whole story's made up, right? There's a lot of people who think that this story is based either on uh, the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, because, you know, the sleeping woman. But wasn't that Sleeping Beauty? I guess there's a Russian version called Snow White and the Seven Warriors. There's also a chance that there was a YouTube video that was released in 2014, and some people say this story didn't exist until before that YouTube video. I couldn't verify that. The YouTube video doesn't exist anymore. Like, the channel's been completely deleted, so that sucks. That would have been interesting. But... What you have, a lot of times when you see the story, is this is the information you get. This professor, this singular guy walks into town and he goes, I'm a professor from a nearby college and we've been doing studies on this body and I'm here to tell you what we found. Because the people in town were really upset by what happened. They're like, dude, we found this thing and then it disappeared and then no one told us anything. A bunch of our relatives were forced to do these military examinations. One dude, one guy went crazy from licking stuff. What is going on? So the military didn't address it. The government didn't address it. Just this random elderly man shows up and says, okay, here's what it is. We've done studies on the body and on the casket and everything. And this woman is 800 million years old. Like the way it was embedded in the side of the mine... The only way it could have been there is if it had been there for 800 million years. We also have run DNA tests on her. She's 100% human. This isn't alien. This isn't any sort of thing like that. And her dress, her see-through dress, that I, I, I personally examined myself because I'm a randy old man. The see-through dress is made of a material and from a technique that is unknown to man. There is no way we could replicate this dress. Victoria's Secrets themselves could not manufacture this. We don't know where the metal box is as well, the one by her head. We're still examining that. And the liquid is also, it's an unknown composition. We have no idea what it is. So basically, I'll get back to the bullet points. She's 800 million years old. That's the most important thing, right? And what's interesting is that I don't believe that at all. I actually really like this story. I just found it the other day, but I don't believe the 800 million year old hypothesis. 
I think that's government disinformation. I don't know. I, I have no alternative theory. I don't know who she is. Again, assuming the story's true. Let's just put on a conspiracy caps and assume it's true. I don't know who she is or where she came from. I don't really buy the 800 million year old theory. I just don't. It, it just doesn't wash. Like, who is this dude? How does he know? They found all this stuff out in five days and five days there. We can't even, we can barely run DNA tests that we get the answers in five days today. Five days later, after all this happened, he just rolls into town. Ah, whatever, dude. I think it's government disinformation. What, and one thing that's interesting about that, the government disinformation thing, is one, it would make future tellings of the story be completely ridiculous to the scientific community. They were like, what? There were no humans 800 million years ago. The other thing is that it also plays into this idea of Russian supremacy. I've seen versions of the story that they said, hey, Russians have been around for 800 million years. Like, you guys were still walking around in caves, bro. The Russians were building this stuff 800 million years ago. I've also seen that thread. Like, this is proof that Russians are the most superior race on the planet because they had beautiful women 800 million years ago while everyone else in the world had just a bunch of just a bunch of hairy people running around in caves, beating each other with clubs and sliding down the necks of brontosauri. So, I mean, that's, that's just ridiculous in and of itself. The 800 million year theory, I don't get... I don't believe that either. I think that's 100% government cover-up. I would say, I mean... If conspiracy cap fully on, if they found this, I don't have another answer for it. I just find it completely fascinating. When I first read this, you want to know my first inclination, because I read this, I had to read a couple different versions of the story. My first guess of this vampire. She was a vampire. Right? You're like, Jason, that's way dumber than theirs. That's way dumb. No, she's a vampire, bro. And that's why. The the cave, the, the the sarcophagi, the sealant melted in the sun. And that goo was protecting her from the sun as well. This thing was never meant to be put back outside. And when they pumped it out, she was turning black and all gross and stuff like that. But she was actually, that was her vampire form burning in the sun. I don't know. <laughs> like I said, I don't really I don't really have a theory. You're like, Jason, now I really do think Russians are the superior race. If I have to choose between vampires are real or that Russians are 800 million years old, you're really putting me in a hard, you're putting me in a hard spot. A fascinating story. And again, it, the local, like all the articles you read about this, even the ones that say it's not true, they're like the locals 100% believe this story happened. In this area, they believe that this is a real story. I just find it so interesting that five days later, this guy showed up and spouted gibberish. And people are like, yeah, that sounds legit. Because they were so thirsty for answers. Right? They really wanted to know what that was. So when someone came, not only answered their questions, but also said, and Russians have been around for 800 million years. Like, that's a boost to your national, national pride. And it gives you answers, even if the answers are dumb. It's a fascinating story. I absolutely love it. Urban legend, real life, real thing that happened, but government disinformation. Or is the whole thing real, right? Is she really 800 million years old? The Soviet government hated paranormal stuff. They really, like, if you saw a UFO and you told the authorities, you did disappear. No, no well or chair needed. They hated this stuff. But I'm sure they were hoarding it, the information, just as much as the states were, just as much as the American government were. Fascinating story. And if it's true, where is this casket now? Have they tried pumping the juice out once more? This time in a, in a darkened room? When they saw the true vampiric form arise from the grave. Or is it just stored somewhere in some Soviet, well now Russian archive? A box among thousands of other artifacts, paranormal and mundane, just collecting dust in some warehouse. Who knows? But if there's ever a spooky, fog-filled night... Somewhere in Russia, maybe zip your jacket up a little bit more. Quit showing off those fancy collarbones you like to flaunt around town, because you never know. The vampire of Russia may be loose once again, looking for you. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. TikTok is at DeadRabbitRadio. 
Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one.